Light rings and toilet paper, dude. 2020. <laughs> dude, we're going to get light rings. We're going to get toilet paper. <laughs> man, you should come out of the house sometime. Come oh, out of the cool, house, man. Sometime, man. We're going to cover fish. We're going to cover <laughs> some fish, man. We'll jam. <laughs> we'll jam, man. Hey everyone, welcome to Hang In and Hang Out, brought to you by Sierra Nevada and Eno. I'm your host, Sadler Vaden. My guest today is a musician, artist, composer. His name's Eric Slick. He's been the drummer of Dr. Dog since 2010. He has a brand new record out called Wiseacre. Eric, how's it going, man? It is going great. How's it going, Sadler? It is going so good, man. I, uh, I really appreciate you... Um, being on this here and uh i want to tell folks that that we feel like we've known each other for a really long time but we actually met uh this year back in february when we were both playing a festival you were with dr dog i was with jason isbell on the 400 unit um we kind of did the thing that musicians do like i was scoping you out i mean i've, I've been a dr dog fan for a while so i was scoping you out uh side stage you know, watching your moves. We were scoping. We were. It was mutual scoping. Yeah, we were connecting. Oh, I felt a connection there. I was watching the 400 unit just, you know, wailing on some Les Pauls. Just, <laughs> woo! <laughs> Do a little uh, dual guitar interplay, have you? There were some, there were some tasters happening. There were some tasty licks being uh, spread between two guitars and then um we and then we were you know sadler and i really wanted to go run to see dave matthews so we gave each That's other right. like a polite we gave like a polite like great set yeah we did we did the thing where you pass and you you kind of you know i don't want to come on too heavy here i don't want to you know i don't want to come on we too heavy like on a, this guy we did like a freak you I'll out see you, i'll see you in catering I'll see you over in the catering zone. Maybe we'll maybe we'll follow each other on the internet. And I feel like I kept seeing your name pop up in my feed because it'd be like, oh, you know, uh, Sadler worked on this record. Sadler has this new thing. And uh, at some at some point, we followed each other. I don't remember who pulled the trigger first. I don't remember who liked who first. But then, s since then, it's been a uh, match made in heaven. I love that ACDC record. Who liked who? Exactly. <laughs> it was AC DC, right? <laughs> Dude, wait, what is the what is the name of that record? Who Who made who, who I think. Who, who made who made who? who? Yeah. Um wow. but uh but but yeah, we we did the musicians to kind of a little too cool for school nod at each other. Hey man, yeah, good job. Yeah, yeah, I dug yeah. your stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, and then but now, now we, but now we now we're in full just like mutual admiration oh you're oh and like texting each other oh wow i checked this out oh cool oh it's so cool oh man i can't can't wait till we hang out yeah we we, we were like like being friends with someone on social media before you like really like meet them in person it's kind of like a pen pal thing you know but it's sort of but it, it's out there for the whole world to see you can it, the whole world can see this beautiful relationship blossoming in front of their eyes you know, and I felt like that's what we had. People are really, you know, noticing us. You know, they might not be listening so. to our, they might not be listening to our records, but they're noticing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, they need to start listening to our records. Eric's got a new record. It's called Wiseacre, Eric Slick, and uh, it's his second solo album. And yeah. um, I've got a new record. It's called Anybody Out There. Or if you want to incorporate right. the question mark, it's Anybody Out There. Anybody out there? I wanted to uh, help, you know, get get this this record of yours, you know, out there to as many people as possible because it's really good, and um, I can't wait for people to check it out if they haven't yet. So uh, it's Eric Slick's new record, Wiseacre, and uh, it came out just a few months ago in August. And um, mm -hmm. I just want to mention that this whole show that we're doing, uh, we're trying to uh, help out the Sweet Relief Musicians Fund to uh, help, you know, musicians and crew members and all those folks in need right now since uh, the coronavirus pandemic has literally brought live shows, 
and concerts and all that stuff to a halt. So you guys check out mm-hmm. Sweet Relief. And um, I think Eric's going to play a song for us. Yeah. What song are you going to do? I'm going to do Children. Hey, this one's called Children. You may look back You may attack The holy rosary intact And I will know Before you know Look on the afterlife on shore Let's, let's talk a little bit about your background because you, you come from a musical family. Um, my grandpa was a trombonist. He played in the Buddy Rich Big Band. So that was like sort of the beginning of the musical stuff in my family. And then um, my Aunt Joni was a harpist in the Philly Orchestra. Um, and then my dad was a guitar player and my dad was a guitar collector. So when we were growing up, my sister and I had this like amazing guitar collection at our disposal. I mean, like he had... Les Pauls and Strats and Fender Coronados and all these kinds of really interesting, uh, you know, not just Les Pauls and Strats, but lots of like interesting guitars, weird guitars. And so we were always surrounded by music. And then um, when I was like really young, my parents put on this Santana record, um, well, kind of a later Santana record, like late 70s. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, that was like my earliest musical memory. Did it have I'm winning on it? No. I'm winning. Oh. I'm winning. Might... Do I do we <laughs> fact check right now and find out which Santana record it is? 
<laughs> I know it's the one Santana 19. I'm just going to type in Santana 1978 and see what happens. Inner Secrets. Ooh. Yeah. Inner. Okay. So it's Inner Secrets and One Chain Don't Make No Prison was the song that like I used to bang out on my crib. And my parents were like, oh, that's really weird that Eric's like banging so heavily on the crib during this Santana song. And then they're like, maybe we could get him a set of bongos. And that's what they did. Yeah, I started on bongos too. Seriously. You did? Well, yeah, we have, yeah, that was like, I feel like that's kind of a, you know, easy thing to get a, a little boy, like just give him some bongos, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, when, when did you start, when did you sit down at, at uh, because I'm, I'm so impressed with uh, your music from a composition standpoint and, uh, and all that, but also like you're, you're a really, really great drummer. So when did, when did you sit down at a drum kit for the first time? So the first time I sat down at a kit, I was five years old. And all year I was, ask, I was asking my parents if I could have a drum set for Hanukkah Christmas because my family's half Jewish. So it was like, I really wanted a drum set. And then they Hanukkah finally Christmas. got me like the, Hanukkah Christmas. Yeah. So they got me this uh, small drum set. And I remember um, just wanting to play Beatles tunes because my family was like, we were, a Be we were a Beatles household for sure. Yeah. I, the, the drums was like the first instrument I uh, sat down at or, or played. Oh, no like, way. You know, the first like real instrument. Yeah. And it was uh, my, my dad's friend Woody's kit uh who he added in a shed out back and um he uh southpaw so it was left yeah and so i learned uh, i learned drums left-handed first and i you know i'm right-handed but um yeah so I, and i loved playing the drums and uh you know and i do find that like guitar players and drummers like um it's, it's underestimated how much guitar players and drummers connect you know it's always like you think of the rhythm section like bass drums but you know, you listen to, to Zeppelin or something like that, like Paige is playing off of Bonham, Bonham's playing off Paige. Like there's a lot more conversation there between drums and guitar than people give it credit for. You you bring up an excellent point. I was just watching that Jim Keltner interview. Have you seen this drum doctor thing? Like, I no, guess I there's this guy in it. This guy out in LA named the Drum Doctor, and he was like providing all of these really classic drums for Jim Keltner and Joey Warnker, um, but he's been doing interview series with them. And Jim Keltner was like, I'm only as good as my rhythm guitar player. And I thought that that was really amazing. He was like, he was like John Lennon. He's like, I worked with John Lennon and, and so much of what I'm doing on the kit is relying upon how strong he was as a rhythm player. Uh, and I was like, that's awesome. I, you know, I, I don't always think of it like that, but that's a hundred percent true. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. And you look at uh, Keith Richards and Charlie Watts and, and their relationship. And Keith, you know, loves to be back there with Charlie. And, uh, you know, uh, Mike Campbell, you know, stands back there near the drum kit and, you know, from Tom Payton, the Heartbreakers. And uh, so, yeah, there's there's a lot more conversation there, too. I know I, I have a lot of friends that are drummers, you know, and it's yes. just kind of, uh, I don't know. I, I And probably because I sat down at the drums for the first time and picked up guitar and, and you look at, uh, you know, rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen, but he was the drummer mm -hmm. Absolutely. first and they switched. Absolutely. And his playing is so rhythmic. And like, I think there's also a thing where like drummers are often frustrated guitarists and guitarists are frustrated drummers. So there's Absolutely. like this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's this, like... You just nailed that. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, yeah. everybody's always like, yeah, people are like bass players are frustrated guitar players. I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with no, that at all. No, no, no. Bass players are just insane people. Yeah, they're just like <laughs> private. They're, they're, they're just like privately insane. This, this next, next one, one is called "When It Comes Down to It." <laughs> Take me in this night, I'm the loneliest one Maybe you're too kind, but I'm having some fun Maybe I'm not certain, I'm a simple person 
it comes down to it When it comes down to it When it comes down to it When it comes down to it Catch me when I fall I recall in the woods Told you not to crawl Now you're miles ahead Maybe I'm not perfect I'm a simple person When it comes down to it When it comes down When it comes down to it When it comes down to it There's a guitar solo here When it comes down to it When it comes down when it comes down to it When it comes down to it <laughs> It's my little bossa nova song So let's talk about, uh, you know, a little bit more about the new record, uh, Wise Acre. How long were you collecting songs for the, and this is your first solo album. Correct. No, this is actually this is my second solo record. This so is your second. My okay. first so, yeah, my first solo record I put out in 2017, and I made all the mistakes that you make when you ma when you're working on your first solo record. Like I doused everything in reverb and put made a song and that went from seven to six, and like I was trying, I was just trying all these ideas, and then not really reining them in. And so at the beginning of 2018, I started working on Wiseacre. And the whole idea was that I would try to um, amass a ton of songs so that I would get better at writing. Um, I had heard that like people are people who are prolific do this where like they'll set time aside every day and work on songs no matter how bad the song is. And I feel like um, I wasn't doing that before. Like I would just sit down and be like, well, I wrote a song and now I'm just, that's it. I'm not going to work on it anymore. I'm not going to like rewrite it. Yeah. There's so much about just like the editing process that, you know, I think when you start out writing and maybe say you don't have, uh, you know, a lot of experience writing or, or say you don't have a producer or someone step in and kind of go, Hey, you need to find the other end of the pencil there, you know? and uh, yeah. erase things or, or 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 go back through a line and say hey you know what that's all I'm, it's almost there what i'm trying to say is almost clear enough even if it's supposed to be you know a little vague or, or whatever it is but but uh that's an important part of the writing process is editing just editing the crap out of that song Absolutely. And I didn't know that, you know, like I thought people just captured lightning in a bottle all the time. You know, I remember reading that, like, like, well, I just remember like Neil Young saying that one day he was really sick and he wrote down by the river and cinnamon girl. And, uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, cowgirl in the sand. He wrote them all in one afternoon. And I would remember just being like, Oh, that's how you write songs. You probably, you just like write them all in a day. But that's not how it works at all. He was probably he was probably writing a ton of songs up until that moment that were okay songs, but it was just like that was a special day. <laughs> you know, that was a really special yeah. day. Yeah. So you felt like this this album, you know, you did a lot more of that going back through and and sort of trimming them and and getting them tighter because it, it certainly sounds that way. It's because it's a really great album. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I was really, I had an aha moment. I was listening to Turn to Stone by ELO and it it dawned on me that like every f like strand of my musical DNA was in ELO. I was like, the first record, the first records that I heard in my house were 
George Harrison's Cloud Nine, The Traveling Wilburys, uh, Volume One, um, you know, like uh, New World Record. Like these were all pivotal albums in my household. And I realized I was like, oh man, I gotta like fo- chase whatever that is. And I, I was thinking, I was thinking a lot about Jeff Lynne and how he can t- kind of tend to be perfectionist, but like he really does go back and like work things and work things and work things until they're right. And even sometimes like George Lucasing it and going back and re-recording full full songs. But right, I have eons of respect for him. Um, but it was definitely just like, man, I'm not going to get better at songs unless I really labor over them. Yeah, that's the only way to get better at them. And uh, man, that we have so much in common. You know, you're uh, we're we're both side men, you know, side yep. musicians. You know, backing yep. people up. You know, in bands. And uh, we, you know, we both like to to make our own music because I think it's just good for our hearts. You know, it's good for our soul to to get our creative rocks off. You know, elsewhere. It's 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 inside. We have to get it out. Yeah, and I think that when you are a side musician, you know, like so much of the time you're mediating between people and that is also not good for the soul. Like you you have to be able to express yourself and oftentimes like because we're more in that mediator position or we're in that observer position, like we have a lot to say. And um I love that you write your own songs and I love that you're going out and like working on it, you know, like you and I are able to commiserate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels good. <laughs> I've been the one since I was born. on my tongue Yes, since I was born I've been the one Yeah, what do I do to get you to think I don't have everything I break your heart with just a smile The golden child The golden child much Cause I can't see the forest from the brush An escape goat is my only crutch Cause I ain't ever had someone love me So Eric, since, uh, you know, this whole thing has brought us, both of us to a halt, like we're not on the road, you know, we've got new records and we can't tour. Um, what's, uh, anything fun you've been doing like while you've been home? I know I've enjoyed just sort of being home for once after, you know, uh, 15 years or so of not being home and, uh, watching the seasons change in front of my eyes. Been doing anything fun? 
Yeah, I mean, I've been teaching drum lessons, which has been super fun. I haven't taught in a really long time. So it's been cool because I have kids that are ranging from like, you know, early teens to 40 years old. Um, so it's it's been a real challenge, like learning how to teach again. And that's awesome. Um, but other than that, you know, I've been recording stuff remotely for people, just trying to like stay active musically as much as humanly possible because... I start sometimes I'll start thinking about the alternatives and I'll be like, oh no, <laughs> you know, like but the wheels start spinning. Yeah, you know, David Lee Roth, uh, what was it after Van Halen? He he uh was a was an I mean, EMT. May, maybe you, you know, and I should work for, work for the, the EMT, David Lee Roth style, like pee in our pants like the hot for teacher video, you know. <laughs> Could you imagine like like you know get like picked up by an ambulance <laughs> coming to in the ambulance is david lee roth it's diamond dave himself do you want to hear a good david lee roth story absolutely people want to hear it the people need to hear this so my friend owned a crystal store in philadelphia and uh van halen was on tour a couple of years ago doing the reunion crystal burgers or just a crystal store just a, just like crystals and like crystal gargoyles <laughs> Yeah, okay. like 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 wellness. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, wellness crystals. So this guy comes into the store, and the the owner of the store is like, "Oh, this guy is like definitely going to the Van Halen show later because he's wearing like a Hawaiian shirt and looks crazy, and he's got a woman in each arm, and he's buying all these gargoyles and bringing them to the front, and." Um, the owner says, oh, so you must be in town for the uh, the show tonight, you know? You, you, you're going to go check him out? And he was like, he he had sunglasses on. He pulled him down and he goes, I am the show! <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh, yeah. oh! I wow. am the show! I think about that. I mean, I guess. All the time. I think about it all the time. <laughs> I guess I would probably do things like that too if I was David Lee Roth. <laughs> I think I, I think like we need to stop being like humble, and when we do return to the road, we need to start acting like that. Yeah, buying gargoyle, just buying gargoyles, putting them on the bus. Yeah, who cares? Wearing sunglasses inside, scarves just everywhere. Yep, yep. Just be yeah. frivolous. Sequin scarves. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know. <laughs> We play music. It's fine. Don't worry about him. He plays music. It's fine. Yeah. 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 He just plays music. He's a crazy person. It's fine. So I like to cook and I always ask the guests on here, if you cook and what have you been cooking? What do you, uh, you know, enjoy as far as food goes since quarantine life has kind of brought us together inside our homes? You know, have you learned to cook anything or do you like to cook regularly? I cook. I'm a big cook. Natalie, my wife, calls me the chef. She's like, my chef, come here. <laughs> uh, but I, I, it's not so much that I've learned to make anything. Um, I just have like my staples. I do love making Szechuan food. So a lot of the times I make a lot of spicy Szechuan food and a lot of like a Mexican, spicy Mexican food. So the bigger, the more the spice, like the happier. I am. Man, that sounds good. That's like the you know, that type of food is definitely hard to find in, in Nashville where we live. It really is, and that's why I cook it a lot, because I miss it. I, I'm a city kid and I'm used to like just being able to go to just being able to go to like Chinatown in Philadelphia and you know, walk San into Francisco. any spot. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I mean and I cook breakfast every morning. I, I love like switching it up so sometimes i make like shakshuka which is like a middle eastern egg dish with like tomato tomato and paprika oh that sounds good i don't even know what that is it's good you got to make some oh, shakshuka i don't even know what that is yeah baby what are you cooking we got a a book uh that has um with indian food recipes in it mm. so we, we've been doing some of that this year and we've also been uh doing some some thai food as well and uh yeah it's just fun to like step out of the normal recipes 
and, and do some different stuff. But yeah, this, this whole time has, has been, uh, you know, spent, um, definitely my wife has a wider palette than I do. So I've been expanding my palette during this whole time. So that's great. I'm coming over to your place to eat. You should come over. Do you, have you been to Bangkokville? I've never been to Bangkokville, but I've been to Bangkok market over here. Okay. Bangkok market Bangkok is great, but, but Bangkokville is a, it's right off Nolensville. It's delicious. Delicious Thai food. Delicious Thai food. Best Penang curry I've ever had in my life. And that's saying something. here, guys. Bangkokville. You heard it first. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not promoting my record. I'm just going to promote <laughs> Bangkokville. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I'm going to do one, one more for you. And it's called Over It. Because, because let's face it, it, 2020, I'm over it. In the bloodlust of the evening, can't help but believe that flame in the furnace that's burning in the furnace if love was all I needed now if I could get it back somehow how can you not about when you joined dr dog that was what what a decade ago 
that was a decade ago and i had been friends with them for a couple years so i went to go see them play back in 2006 and i was i was like man this band is really really great i picked up their uh first record easy beat and then like every time they played in philadelphia i would kind of be creeping in the corner like hey guys and eventually we struck up a friendship <laughs> um and it, it was so uh like fam familial right off the bat like um they took me out for my 21st birthday they were like they promised me a year before my 21st birthday like we're, we'll re we will remember your birthday and we'll take you out and i was like there's no way that's going to actually happen and it was my 21st birthday and they called me on my parents phone my parents landline and they were like because i was still living at home <laughs> they called me on my parents landline and they're like uh the black keys are in town do you want to go see them and i had never heard the black keys before and I ended up going to go see them and I ended up hanging out with them until like five o'clock in the morning. And then like, it just, it was just like stuff like that, like really fun, just, uh, you know, familial kind of hangs. And then, um, their drummer quit in 2009 and I was about to quit drumming actually. Wow. I was really? like, I'm done. I was like, I'm done. This isn't for me. I don't think I should do it. So I were think, you like, playing with someone at that point? Yeah, Were you playing, playing with someone with at that point? I was. I was playing with Adrian Ballou of King Crimson. And uh, I was in a band with him and my sister. And we had taken it really far. And it was amazing. But I was also just kind of getting burnt on, on touring. And I was just kind of unsure if it was something I actually wanted to do with my life. And then I ran into Zach, the keyboardist of Dr. Dog. And I told him, I was like, yeah, I'm not. I think I'm done drumming. Like, I'm not really up to anything. And he was like oh interesting and then a week later he was like do you want to join dr dog and i was like yes <laughs> yes i yes i do i suddenly just changed my mind and i would love to join the band um oh that's cool and so i had sold all my drums so i had to like use the old drummer's kit for the first tour that i did with them um, <laughs> did he rent them to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well the band bought that kit so technically oh, it was the band's no. kit uh yeah. but yeah i, I toured on that kit and it was funny because after like the third show with them they were like i don't f think this is gonna work out they were like your style is very different than what we do because i was like because i was like a prog kid i was like a prog rock drummer and so dr dog is not prog rock by any stretch of the imagination but um, what what is amazing about them is their knack for writing parts and they put a lot of energy into writing drum parts and so if i would change anything they would kind of look back at me and be like well why'd you change well that's the part you got to play the part and for, for me like i came from an improvisational background i didn't really see the value in like doing the same thing every night but then i really learned the value of that and how important it is to commit to an idea because that's what gives it its purpose, you know? Playing for different people every night too, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's important that, you know, you're, you're playing uh, for different folks every night who have lived with that music, you know, and, and some, some folks get, get, uh, you know, tied up with a, uh, a drum part, you know, they want to, they want to show up and see it or a guitar lick or whatever. It's, it's there in their minds. They expect it to be there. There's people who look at me when I'm playing and they'll like do the, I'll watch them do the fills. And yeah. if I don't do them, they're like kind of scratching their head. So it's really important to commit to those <laughs> ideas. <laughs> they're just like, why isn't it there? <laughs> no, that's not the right fill. <laughs> yeah. That's different. Um, yeah. And I think like over, over time, and I'm sure you feel this way too, like you can improvise within reason, but like most of the time it, it's important to commit to the part. Yeah, I'm sort of of the mindset of like honoring the signature part, but you know, a little inflection here. Like I know playing in uh, Jason's group, like um, he doesn't expect you to just do the exact same thing every single night. I mean, he honestly encourage you, encourages you to, you know, step out a little bit, kind of yep. go off, you know, uh, the program. Um, but, uh, you know, I still look at it as, you know, the part that should be there, 
that that people know yeah. and they love and it's it's gotten into their brain and uh they've lived with it for so long so um but i, I like when someone kind of does that but also puts their own taste to it so yeah that's funny though they were like um no no that's you're not doing the right the right drum fill there that's yeah, really funny i think they're I think they were also worried that I was like a little heavy handed as a player because at the time I was just so excited to play that I was like beating the crap out of the drums. So I think there was a part of it that was like, it was like exciting, but it's also like you also have to play with dynamics and subtlety in order for something to to not be like grating on someone's eardrums. <laughs> so. You know, what's wild is that, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, Southern rock and roll southern jam yeah the almond brothers who were completely improvisational yeah. you know and they and and they exactly. were very um yeah you know they, they uh they they didn't just noodle but uh they did they did jam and and, and they were such like fans of of jazz and, and things like that um but then you have the other uh, opposite of the spectrum leonard skinner there was no uh, improvising, which is wild, you know. Hype, like hyper composed. And I think I, I live somewhere kind of between the two now where like I love being able to honor parts that I know are important and then improvise within them. But yeah, you're totally right. They couldn't be. Almond Brothers and Leonard Skinner are like kind of unfairly grouped together. They are. They're extremely different. Yeah, that, yeah. that's a... That's a good way to put it. Um, and I've always yeah. been kind of like weirded out that, that they're so they're grouped together uh, so closely, yeah. you know, um, because they really are different. And Leonard Skinner did sort of like create um, almost like pop songs, you know, too. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they were, they were songs sort of meant for the radio. You right? know, they, they, I, yeah, they were. And a song that I think about a lot is uh, Ooh, That Smell. Because, like, yeah. I had, for the longest time, I was like, what is that song about? Like, did, did someone, <laughs> like, yeah. like, like did, some, <laughs> did somebody, did somebody fart on the tour bus? And then <laughs> I, I, I learned recently that that song is about, like, the smell of death. Like, Ooh, That Smell. This, I was like, what? And then it was released four days before the plane crash. I didn't, all this is new information to me. But yeah, yeah. we did a uh, Skinner tribute, uh, I think two years ago in Nashville, me and a couple of guys, a guy named Charlie Warsham, a guy named uh, John Osborne, mm -hmm. who's in Brothers Osborne. Mm -hmm. And man, yep. I tell you what, and I've always had a lot of respect for that band and, and you know, learning guitar when you're in the rock and roll music, I mean, you're going to learn Skinner, uh, especially where I come from. Um, they were never my favorite band by any means, but you know, I grew up learning some of those parts, but, but, uh, uh getting my head together for this tribute show, it was like, uh, man, it was a lot of work and I enjoyed it, but wow. The, uh, just the, the musicality, the, you know, the parts, um, this guy should really just playing their asses off. It's really incredible. And, you know, the first record had Tuesdays gone and Freebird on it. And, you know, that's just amazing. Um, so Ab respect. Absolutely. They're amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally am more of an Almond Brothers guy because I recognize all the odd time signatures and like the yeah. modal playing and like, there's so much, there's so much interesting, like, wow, they were influenced by these records. You know, like, I'm always surprised with Almond Brothers how deep the, the musical knowledge is. And also just, like, I remember reading that, like, the two drummers, J-Mo and I, I'm, uh, Trucks, uh, would, like, put their hand Butch Trucks would put their hands over each other's hearts and, like, sync up their heartbeats. Like, I mean, I'm pretty <laughs> new agey. So I'm, for, I'm pretty new agey, so I'm really into that stuff. Um, you guys check out Eric Slick's new record. It's called Wiseacre. Um, it's a it's a really really great listen, and it's different. The production is great. Like all the playing is great. Um, everything about it, I just love, and it's it's super reminiscent of, to me, like a, the, that sweet spot, like mid to late seventies. Um, that's just where it puts me, and and I love that spot. You really nailed it because I 
that was a specific thing that I was trying to go for. Like this era of like 1976 to 1981 of like where synthesizers and dry, like synthesizers weren't that good yet. You know, like they were all analog. So like things were kind of janky and the drumming was like very dry. There's like still strings on stuff. It's almost like disco-y, but then there's also like this weird paranoid new wave angle. So like there's like these <laughs> Robert, like Robert, like, like uh, Robert Palmer is the kind of the perfect example or like Todd Rundgren. Like those are things that I was really into when I was making the record for sure. Yeah. Synthesizers weren't very good yet, but everyone was excited to use them. Exactly. People were like, well, we got to get, we got to get it on the record because we got to keep up, you know, like I think about like when all those artists started making disco music and they were like, you know, Rolling Stones version of that is miss you. And Rod Stewart's version of that is, do you think I'm sexy? And like, they're not quite disco, but they, but they're weird songs. Yeah. Like miss you is an extremely weird song. Even Kiss went disco. I I you was know? paid to fly. I was paid to fly with you, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just I love where you took this record, and, and uh, I, you know I, I think we we um we we really do have a lot in common. I mean, I was I was uh ta- taking my record to a different part of the the seventies, and and almost almost probably in a weird way a different part of the nineties too. I feel like yes, my record has yes. a little bit of '90s thing going on in the good, the good part of the '90s. No, you do. Yeah, it's like that mid '90s era where records, you know, were kind of coming out of grunge. You know, it was before um, what they would call post grunge, I guess. You know, and then it was it was like records like Wildflowers were coming out, and then the Wallflowers bringing down the horse and things like that. Were records, man? Those records sound really good. You know, they're kind of timeless you, you, sounding. You definitely have that like T Bone Burnett thing going on in your production style, but you also I I hear like an Oasis thing going on a little bit, it's a, twi- a little little twinge of like the 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 Brit pop. Um, Absolutely, that's just what that, that's where I hear it. But I also definitely hear the, I hear the T Bone. I hear like the second Cheryl Crow record, like uh, yeah, Wildflowers definitely, um, which. What, like I'm so glad that that record's finally getting its moment in the sun. Yes, it's it's really cool that uh, that they're they're putting out that deluxe Wildflowers by Tom Petty. And from what I hear, that was like his original, you know, um, mm-hmm. plan was for it to be a double album. But I think I heard somewhere that it was going to be too expensive for fans. So that's that's why it was just a single album. Which mm-hmm. he was always doing the right thing by his audience, you know not not have a double album would have been really pricey for for uh you know his uh his he was blue collar fan he, he was the best i mean like he I, I, maybe it was quest love who said this where it was like tom petty has perfected all seven types of songs <laughs> what are the seven types you think i forget why he said this but it was just like tom petty has mastered like the arch like the formulaic archetype of a perfect pop song and he's done so you know he quest love was like most people get most people are writing the same song over and over and over again like uh for example you know someone like neil young is like you're if you buy a neil young record like you're gonna get an a minor chord to a D minor chord at some point, and it's gonna have that thing. It's gonna yeah. have that thing that Neil Young does. But Tom Petty actually shows a very wide range of breadth and diversity in his songwriting style. Certainly, I think that's what Questlove is uh, trying to talk about. And I mean, American Girl may be one of the most ripped off beats and songs of all time. <laughs> I mean, just like. There was a point in time in New York when I think I think everybody was like, "This is my American Girl song." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was called "Last Night" by The Strokes. That's right, you nailed it. But yeah, it's I mean, you know, when you think about it, I mean, that's just rock and roll music. You know, when you're making true rock and roll, you know, there's country, there's blues, there's like that little bit of pop element as things kind of you know, grew. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely that's why Tom Petty is just considered rock and roll, you know. 
I've lost I've lost my light and my camera at the same time. <laughs> Eric's face went dark. You just look like a shadow. Now I look like a scary scary ghost, Eric. <laughs> yeah, we got we we got plenty of stuff. But I kind of forgot we were doing this whole thing. I was just getting into talking rock and roll. I think we needed that so that we have some like playful stuff along with all the like and what do you do formalities and such nobody wants that <laughs> <laughs>